Well, thank you very much. I appreciate um, the introduction. Um, happy to be uh, back at Stanford. Um, I practically never left. Uh, you know, uh, I'm going to tell a little bit more about my my story. So we, I've been always involved um, in one way or the other with with a lot of Stanford uh, related activities. Um, Today I thought that first I give maybe a quick background about my, myself and like you know what I did and where I'm coming from and um, then talk a bit more about Genapsis and what you're doing there and open it up to any question that may exist. Um, making sure that this is good. So <clears throat> at Genapsis the motto is digitize the world. We're going to come back to it. What's the relevance to digitize the world? Why digitize the world if it's a DNA sequencing company? I'm coming, um, I, I was uh, born and raised in Iran, um, a country in Middle East. Um, Iran and Iraq are neighbors, even though some pre people couldn't really make a distinction between the two, uh, but they're two different countries. Um, and um, in Iran, I was born in a city called Sirjan, in middle south of Iran. It's a little uh, town uh, with 150,000 people. Um, and the um, historically is a few thousand years old town or city. Um, the main business of people over there either is pistachio farms or is like a beautiful Persian rocks uh, called Kilim or Gelim. Um, I was born in a, a middle class family. Both of my t parents are teachers. Uh, my dad was teaching science in middle school, and my mom was an elementary school teacher. Um, after I got my bachelor, um, I got my high school diploma in math and physics. In Iran, you select even in high school if you, if you wanted to study math and physics versus biology versus you know art. Then I went to Tehran, the capital city. I got a bachelor in electrical engineering from Sharif University of Technology. If you're an um, electrical engineer here, I'm sure you probably met some other people from Sharif University as well. Um, then um, right after that, I came. I did a dual degree in petroleum engineering, which was just a, a you know, random thing. And then I came to Stanford uh, getting my master's. Uh, both in EE and two years later in MSNE, management science, um, and got my PhD in electrical engineering. The last year of PhD, I went to med school. It seemed that I really liked school, um, but I never finished that. Uh, I started a company, uh, uh, Genapsis, and that's really the three areas and three places that I've been over the past uh, 15 years. Um, I have three brothers. Uh, no sister. All three of my brothers actually, they did very similar story. They got their master PhD also here at EE at Stanford. Um, one of them, the youngest one, is his postdoc right now here. You probably see him around. The uh, second youngest, which is on the left side, is working for KLA Tanker. Uh, he did his PhD um, with uh, Marty Fayer in uh, Ginston Lab. And Rahim, um, worked, um, he's, he's now an engineering research um, associate at Stanford as well. So he got his master PhD postdoc here as well. So from that standpoint, we've always been around. We've been here at Stanford and you may see them um, as, as the student here. Um, in my past life, I was working on completely different stuff. I was working on radars and signal processing, hardcore signal processing, uh, wireless communication related stuff. Uh, actually, I was part of the um, wireless network lab in the third floor of Packard building, um, which was Ahmad Bahai and Andre Goldsmith lab. And there was a very interesting project using a um, multi-antenna radar imaging system using multi-antennas UWB ultra-wideband to see the signal behind the wall. Um, I was interested in healthcare for very personal reason. A family member of mine, close family member of mine, was misdiagnosed at a really young age, age of 15. And it was very disturbing to watch how broken medicine is. I mean, when coming to some conductor and uh, when coming to nanotechnology, we're pretty advanced. I mean, th these, these gadgets, the phones that we have is really a miracle. I said before that if Steve Jobs claimed to be a prophet, I was in his religion. 
you know, this is really amazing what electrical engineers have achieved over the past um, two, three decades. We can move atoms. We can write IBM with 18 atoms. But if it goes to medicine, we are still in a cave age. You know, you get, you get different type of weird diseases and like, you know, you're just telling you that, hey, you have like cancer. I mean, wait, what? <laughs> it was not supposed to be. In fact, a, a dear friend of mine has a cousin who, the cousin is a um, serial entrepreneur, very successful PhD from Carnegie Mellon Computer Science, 35 years old. And two months ago, 35 years old, two months ago got diagnosed with a state three brain tumor. And it's not even the type that you can operate. It's just quite, you know, separated. Basically, it's a thin layer on top of brain. And, you know, imagine that you're like 30 or 35 years old or so on and so forth. And then just telling you that you're stage three and you have like a few months to live. We know that great people, in fact, who are contributing a lot, like one of the Stanford E professors, one of the nicest people that I've ever met when I was at school, you know, got diagnosed with cancer. Um, at a very young age. Um, so these type of diseases are really hunting us down, impacting our lives, and we don't really know what's going on. And it was very disturbing to really um, deal with that concept. Why medicine is still so behind? Why medicine is still in the cave age? So I started learning, about more, I started learning more about genomics and DNA sequencing. And when you dig in, um, basically in the world of biology, we, the, the highest resolution things that you have is like molecules, um, nucleic acids, which is DNA, RNA. Then from RNAs, you're creating proteins. Proteins are the one who's defining the function of the cell. And then you have cells, which is like, you know, a bunch of cells creating organs and the rest of these as our body. So majority of these diseases having some sort of genomic cause or a genetic uh, relevance. Um, different type of cancers. Cancer is DNA disease. Cancer is when the DNA is like, you know, ATCGs is um, not happening in the right place. Majority of the time in the DNA, but also RNA. We have the same thing also in the protein level. So these are molecules, and these molecules are really teeny tiny. Um, a DNA molecule, like, we have about 38 trillion cells in our body. Each cell has DNA. <coughs> DNA, the whole DNA of a human for each cell is 6.4 billion base per ATCGs. And um, so it's a lot of information. And we all started from one cell, like in, in a fetus. And that started replicating one to two, two to four, four to 16, and so on and so forth. And now we are 38 trillion cells. And every moment of time, we have like, you know, billions of new cells that is really happening. This process, like any other process in the world, is not perfect. So there are errors happening in the, in the process of like replication of one cell to two cell. So you have this DNA in the double helix, as you know, is get single stranded and the second strand get built up. This process um, with the enzyme that is trying to really build the second DNA, the first enzyme error is 10 to the minus seven. There's a second enzyme coming trying to clean the, uh, some errors up and that's about 10 to the minus two. So if everything works really perfectly, then you have about 10 to the minus nine error rate. And of course, you have 6.4, 10 to the nine bases. So you, know, you get about maybe six of them wrong. And depends on where that happens, you might be in a okay shape and you know, uh, basically life continues or you're, you're in trouble. And of course, as we grow, this number, like if you have an error here and another error there, like, you know, this is higher chance of you getting to a problem. And that's why with age, we increase the chance of getting diseases like cancers and whatnot. Of course, we can inherit these things from our parents or it can happen during our lifetime. DNA molecule, each base ATCGs are um, less than a nanometer apart. Of course, it's a 3D structure. So they're really um, small molecules, uh, you know, with the ATCGs, you want to read them. DNA sequencing is the, is the method of reading that code. That, like, you know, what is the code basically associated to this one? Um, when I was trying to dig into these, I realized that, okay, well, reading that DNA and RNA code is very important part of understanding majority of these diseases. 
the methods that existed for these are mainly optical technologies. So the way that they do it is that, um, and that's both for optical technologies and other technologies, is called, uh, most, of, most of them is called sequencing by synthesis. So how does that work? The same uh, thing that I explained that like, you know, from one cell we're creating the second, uh, one cell getting to two cells and the DNA get double-stranded, that's a synthesized part of the DNA. They're using the same trick to read the code. So the way that you do it, you have a single strand DNA that made of ATCGs. You're injecting ATCG in cycle. You know what you're injecting in, and you're building the second strand next to it. If these nucleotides stick here, and A only stick to T, as you know, and C only stick to G, so if it happens here, and you can somehow detect the reaction, then since you know what you injected in, you know the complementary strand. And that method called sequencing by synthesis, or SBS. Historically, this method, the way that you're trying to detect these ATCGs, is by attaching a fluorophore, some, you know, a colored uh, tag, to those ATCG. And then doing a multi-stage chemical reactions and using a high power laser to excite that fluorophore and taking images and finding out the proper frequency for that image, and find out if that really got stick here or not, if the reaction happened or not. And that's the method that has been used. It's optical, technologies, it's optical technology, and is in a different form factor, but majority of them are the same concept. Those high power lasers and uh, requirements of a scanner and a robot, et cetera, make the device really expensive. You're talking about from hundreds of thousands of dollars to $10 million devices, average of a million dollar. It also makes it pretty slow. Historically, the first time the method based on for DNA sequencing took 13 years. From 1991 to 2003, $3.8 billion to read one human genome. Of course, the price came down since then a lot, and there's been a lot of activities going on, but again, the cost per test or cost per run reduced to some extent, but the cost of these machines hasn't changed massively. So <clears throat> when I was learning more about these methods and coming from electronic engineering and electrical engineering background, I was thinking about why we're not measuring the electrical change of this reaction. Uh, very simple idea, of course, what they're teaching us in engineering school is like, you know, I and V, I multiplied by V is power, so that's about energy, and I is the current over time, so like, you know, and here we have a reaction, so definitely there should be some sort of a change of charge, and also there's some, some sort of a change of energy. So I brought that idea to head of Stanford Genome Technology Center, uh, Professor Ron Davis, uh, who's an amazing guy. So Ron has four bachelors, physics, math, biology, botany, PhD in biochemistry from Caltech, postdoc with Jim Watson, the Nobel laureate at Harvard, and there was a Stanford professor from age of, I don't know, 28, 29. Now I'm talking to him, he's 64 years old. And I'm telling him that like, you know, how about we using some sort of a macro sensors and like, you know, and again, while he's not an engineer, and he's not an electrical engineer, he, 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 he walks the walk, he understands what I was referring to. And what I was explaining that like we can use some conductor technologies, he was very excited about the potential he can bring to the table. And then he started telling me that if he can really build that, that could be very revolutionary, that could be very game changing because of we need genetic testing and reading this information for tons of different applications. Healthcare is only one of them, as, as the professor mentioned. So um, he convinced me I should work on it as my PhD project. I did so. I moved from radar to DNA. And while it looks so different, and there was a lot of you know, interesting learning over the course of the past decade, but there's a lot of similarities, believe it or not. Both of them is about signal to noise. Both of them you do detection. And both of them you do estimation. You do it's a signal processing. So like you're design, defining a sensor, you're designing it, you're measuring the things. I mean, environment is different. Of course, here you're define, designing a chip that historically packaging of the chip is supposed to have no moisture around that. Here we're just injecting the moisture to the chip. So, <laughs> you know, it requires some um, special uh, treatment, but that's engineering challenges and this is fine. So 
That's how I started working at the Stanford Genome Technology Center and um, chose a co-advisor also in the CIS building, which uh, that's a, another story that we were working on that uh, um, lithography related project. Um, the first two years of my PhD, I was developing a quasi electronic technology based on the, I explained, you, uh, I explained to you that there's like you know, charge that you can detect or energy. So charge, there's a multiple versions of this charge that you can detect. One of them is the proton or H plus ion that is get released of that reaction. So you can build a ion sensitive field effect transistor or ISFET and you know, having the DNA molecules right above that and then the moment that this reaction happens that we just talked about, now the proton gets released right there. You can, you know, that works like changing of the gate voltage. And then you can see that in the IV current, uh, current voltage curve, and you can detect it over time. And you can do it for every single one of them over time. And since you know what you injected in, you can really read the DNA. So that was quite exciting. We've done the similar things also for showing the um, energy detection. We call it thermo sequencing because there's some sort of a thermal measurement. And that took you know, um, three, four years uh, here at Stanford that was doing the different sort of a proof of concept of that one. But the majority of these two technology was, uh, were back in 2004, 2005. Soon we learned that even though that has some advantages, that now we can use a semiconductor chip and reduce the cost of this device from multi hundred thousand dollars to probably 50 grand or 20 grand or such. Still the workflow, workflow is the whole process of really getting these things. It's not as easy as what we like if you want to distribute this in a larger scale. The whole concept of PC in the world of mainframes for genomics. For instance, when you're trying to detect pH, one of the issues that you're running into because of your detecting delta pH, you're detecting the release of proton ions, H plus ions, then your solution has to be in a very low buffer capacity. I don't know if you know what buffer capacity, what that means, like it's similar to the capacitors that we have, you know, uh, um, basically we have a high capacity versus low capacity. The same thing exists also for solutions. Solutions, they're adding some, you know, additional um, materials there that basically doesn't allow big change of pH. And for majority of the bio-related work, that's how the biology works. They usually have stuff like trees and so on and so forth are in the solutions, keeping the um, uh, capacity high. Now, if you wanted to detect the delta pH, you have to operate in an environment which actually has to be low pH. So to some extent, enzyme doesn't like it. There's some other challenges that you're running into. But there's actually another problem. If you have a low buffer, um, a low buffer capacity solution, the moment that it touches the air, the CO2 of the air can get dissolved here, and that <laughs> CO2 get dissolved creates a big delta pH. So your signal, your noise is going to be way bigger than the signal you're trying to detect. So you have to really protect your liquid from any um, air. And for that purpose, you require a nitrogen tank or argon tank or so, so on and so forth to really use that. So that's one additional requirement. Also, the amount of data that you were collecting was less than images that historically people were collecting, but it still was more than what we could really just upload it to a cloud system and have it decentralized. Remember, we were trying to really figure out a way to make something which can be used for you know, a really large scale with many people, not just and not yet another like a Me Too version of things for the labs. So we start developing a new technology, which this time we call it the pure electronic or direct measurement. And that's really what we developed about uh, four years at Stanford until um, late 2010. And then uh, incorporated the company. I got my PhD, uh, defended the PhD um, in December 2009. Um, wrote the thesis right after, incorporated the company in early 2010, um, licensed uh, all of this work that you were talking about from OTL. That's a whole other subject that we can talk about probably for six hours. Um, you know, how to get that one and what type of like, you know, goods and bad and uglies exist around, like you know, how to deal with OTL. Um, and then um, we got a lot of government grants when we were developing the technology back at Stanford. Now I start writing some grants um, for the company. Um, we've given that 
we had the initial uh, success, they were start giving us money for the company, which was very helpful. So um, got some seed funding, uh, uh, incubator uh, in Menlo Park, um, 700 square feet lab, um, two office upstairs, and then shared conference rooms and restrooms and the rest. Um, and hired some consultants, brought some of the people working with me at Stanford. Um, fantastic SAB board, 10 Stanford prof, prof, a couple of Harvard and MITs, Berkeley, Script, etc. We're trying to not discriminate. Still, we had like 10 times more from Stanford than other places. Um, and then, you know, that, that journey started now. It's been um, close to seven years, six and a half years. So we start building. At Stanford, we were working more of the core of the technology. It was more of a, like, you know, a proof of concept detection. Since then, we start building, okay, well, now let's build the, the, the instrument. Let's build the chip. Let's build the multiple versions of instruments from a breadboard to a prototype to start changing the prototypes to an alpha machine and a beta machine and a commercial beta machine, et cetera. This is an extremely interdisciplinary project. It's probably the most interdisciplinary project you can imagine. You have, we have in our company um, hardcore chip designers, analog digital, like you know, uh, working on a uh, hired from Apple and Intel and whatnot. We have people, uh, surface chemists. We have molecular biologists. We have electrical engineers who are designing boards in the PCB level. We have microfluidic people. We have. Um, um, you know, uh, bioinformatics, there's a, there's a um, molecular biology, microbiology, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole, um, um, about 10 different disciplines needs to work together to make this technology to work. It's been a fascinating ride. To date, we brought in, in the development of the technology, close to $100 million in. Um, half of that was from venture capitals, uh, you know, seed round, series A, series B. The rest was non-dilutive capital in one way or the other. Um, and then we have a great pent-up demand from the market. You know, this is something that is quite exciting that uh, people are interested to use. I'm going to give you a little bit more background about, you know, in general, the use cases of these and why this, what we need really to enable in that front. Um, remember, I was talking about the pH detection story. That's the very first thing that we developed here. And we decided to put it aside and not using it. About two years later, back in 2007, end of 2007, 2008, one day I got a call from someone and then um, asking questions about that technology. And I was a PhD student like you guys. And I had no idea about like, how to talk to a businessman um, calling me from outside and asking a lot of detailed questions. And after one hour of detailed question, he told me, oh, by the way, um, I want to make sure that I'm not asking any confidential information. I said, oh, thanks, to let, <laughs> thanks for letting me know now at the end of the call. So um, long story short, there was um, one of the folks who, who were in this business and built a couple of companies in a uh, related field were very interested about that pH detection platform. Requested to license that from, uh, from us, from Stanford. I was just the inventor. Um, and finally, after 18 months of back and forth, he got a non-exclusive license on that platform. During this time, they started also building a prototype. Well, uh, he had, um, you know, again, given his previous experience, he also had money and other things, so he could move things forward. In June 2010, June 22nd, 2010, he finally, I think, got the license. About 45 days later, we got the news that that company called Iron Torrent got sold for $740 million to Life Technologies. And we said, what exactly happened here? Like, you know, uh, so Stanford did a okay deal. Um, probably they could do much better than what they've done, but that's not something that you know, it's impacted me financially, but that's not, except that it's, it's their business. The good news was that Iron Torrent ended up in hand of Life Technologies, which is the main company who did the human genome project uh, equipment development. Year and a half later, they commercialized that um, in 2011. And then in 2014, Life Technologies got sold to Thermo Fisher. That's one of the largest companies in this field for $15.6 billion. And there are rumors about like, what exactly the Iron Torrent piece you know, uh, 
valued, but it was a good portion. Today, that's the second largest platform that is offered as a DNA sequencing out there in the world. So ma majority of the market is in the hand of a company called Illumina. This is an optical-based platform that commercialized, they bought a company called Solexa, a startup company uh, called Solexa in 2007, and then they commercialized it, and for the past 10 years they've been offering it. They have the range of hundreds of thousands of dollars to $10 million machine, own a major stake in the market. The second is the Ion Torrent platform. While, um, again, um, Stanford deal was um, an interesting one, it was very, for me, it was very fascinating to see that the project that we were working on, and we literally put it aside, we just said, like, you know, this is not good enough for the purpose we're trying to achieve, now is offering, and, you know, actually in oncology, that's a very, uh, this is probably the most successful one, and is a, is a, you know, commercially available product that you can, you know, go to, you know, you can go to Temu Fisher website, and you can buy it, and, you know, many labs are using it, and worldwide. The reason I brought it up, trying to say that while we are students here and working on, you know, this idea or that idea, sometimes we don't realize the work that you're doing could be quite, <laughs> quite valuable, quite, you know, worthy of something. Not necessarily only from the financial standpoint, but also from the impact standpoint, from something that could be like, you know, a very valuable something that exists in the planet Earth. When I came to Stanford as an electrical engineer, we're thinking about, you know, I studied uh, signal processing, and I studied, uh, and that's, what, that's the only thing that I was considering to really work on. I was not really open to, you know, exposed to other stuff, except uh, until I really started changing the major. And then, well, not the major, the field, the work that I was doing. But then I learned that actually what I learned in bachelor was, frankly, <laughs> nothing. You know, this is a basic science that you learn about, you know, how you can get yourself exposed to something different. And in my opinion, electrical engineering is the best major in the world because of, you know, both math and physics in a very practical, analytical way. So you can analyze almost everything that you like to have. So it gives us the opportunity to really tackle the problems which are not in the um, historical electrical engineering field and be very impactful. Um, in fact, I think that the work that historically electrical engineers were doing are, are over. They did such a good job, we don't need that anymore. Um, back in uh, days ago, um, Professor Tom Lee, which I believe he still is teaching, uh, one day he came to a class and he said that in the next five years, every dog even gonna have a cell phone. So working on cell phone wouldn't be as fancy as you think. So wireless communication went to a very, very high rise. But like, you know, then after that, like, we have amazing solutions. And then if you want to spend your life of five years and developing a specific things that are going to increase the efficiency of one of those algorithms that maybe the voice behind the cell phone going to get 2.5% you know, improved, it may not really reflect in the impact that you're looking for long run. Yes, you're going to get a PhD, don't worry about that. But except that, you, 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 have, you have much more power to really implement if you're going to go out of the original field and trying to implement this um, knowledge and know-how in, in multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary areas. So with that, I'll, I'll pause for a moment and see if there's any question, if anything we wanted to talk about before I go to the next section, which is about, which is about um, you know, Genapsis and the company. Awesome. So, <clears throat> what, um, what we are trying to enable and what we're trying to achieve um, at Genapsis, we call it a molecular reader like one of the applications of the technology that we developed is DNA sequencing. But it's not only DNA sequencing, it's actually, uh, you can use it for quite a range of other very small molecules like DNA, RNA, proteins, or even cells, single cell analysis. And it would be very impactful uh, to have such a system, especially if it would be low cost. Cost matter at the end of the day a lot. Um, I'm gonna explain in a couple of slides why. Um, it would be fast, 
would be accurate and easy to use. Ease of use is very important in my opinion. And at the end, it has to be portable. It has to be something that we can really have it wherever we need to have this technology. And the reason is we are living in the world of biology. And everything around us, majority of that, like a 95% plus, is, is actually biological stuff. We're made of 38 trillion cells in our body. We have more microbes in our gut than the cell in the body. The coffee that you drink, the tea, the, the food, um, this cotton, the leather, the, you know, this, this wood, these are all like everything that you see around you, these are all like, you know, these are, they have molecular information. And today we are blind to it. We don't have an easy way to read that. But this is abundance level of extremely distributed information that is very critical. And these are, these are impacting not only our healthcare, but tons of other applications. It's very critical to be able to read this information in a low cost, easy to use, fast, and very distributed manner. That's something that needs to happen, like by Genapsis or by somebody else, but it has to happen. I, I have no doubt on that front. And this is something that, again, thinking about this feature set, we have been focusing on trying to see how we can enable. So you all know that DNA, we already talked about it, is the computer code of life and uh, really defining a lot of um, functions of the, uh, everything around us. And cancer is the gene disease or the change in the mutation. But if you wanted to look at some numbers, if you wanted to look at some statistics, some of these statistics are extremely uh, interesting and scary, frankly. The chance of getting cancer during our lifetime, the first time I saw that, I actually freaked out, is more than 40%. More than 40%. So it means like you know, in this room right now, we have like 12 people, we have or 13 you know, people right now sitting here. We're talking about like, you know, at least five people are gonna get cancer during our lifetime. You know, if you're thinking about it, it's, it's a little bit, you know, serious number. It's not like a you know, 0.01% chance. It's a very high number. But the chances of success of a drug that has been built to diagnose cancer, to deal with cancer, is less than 10%. You will spend 10 years, eight to 10 years, a billion dollar, at the end, starting with 10,000 compounds, going all the way to one, clinical trial one, clinical trial two, clinical trial three. If it works only for 30% of the population, we have to trash the drug. Because it's pretty much, a, like a lot of these is pretty much a blind studies. Like you just do these and you pass it through. Clinical trials are a version of really trying to test it in a little bit more meaningful way. Because we don't have an easy way to really look at these markers and find out if it works for 30%, what is specific about that 30%? If, if it works for 30%, let's get the drug out for that 30%. You save the drug, you save a billion dollar, and now the solution is a, is a much smaller solution. Uh, the problem is a much smaller problem. You need to only find a solution for the remaining 70%, and so on and so forth. It's called companion diagnostic. This field of really finding a way to get the drug out is called companion diagnostic. Pretty interesting field. And that's one area that is very important, how we can really deal with that. But application of genomics and DNA sequencing is way beyond healthcare. <laughs> when we're talking about healthcare, there is prognostic. Prognostic means like super early diagnostic, early diagnostic. That is almost the best way to deal with something like cancer. Effective diagnostic, finding the treatment after you even you know, figure out basically what's wrong with the person. <coughs> Let's use the example of the cancer that we've been focusing on. Should we use chemotherapy A or chemotherapy B or surgery or radiotherapy? You cannot do all of them. You're gonna kill the patient. So, the question is that which one you want to really effectively implement. So finding the effective treatment. Then monitoring the treatment throughout the process. Finding out if the number of bad cells, the cancer cells, goes really down or not. Right now, we're just like, you know, basically doing a surgery and doing a chemotherapy on top of it and looking at the temperature and say, oh, do you feel well? And he or she will say that, yeah, I will do well. So, oh, that's good. And then six months later, one year later, two years later, you hear about remission. Because even if some, some amount of those cancers are left behind, then they start replicating and you're still in trouble. Or 
the, the, the cancer cells will start developing drug resistance um, after you start injecting these things, and then they don't respond anymore. And those little remaining ones are still quite pro uh, problematic. So monitoring through the treatment. And of course, finding the effective drug, as we talked about, to really find out what is unique about these patients, what is about you know, their gene marker. And has been numerous amount of clinical studies who's shown that actually with your gene marker, you can find out which drug might be more effective for you. There's a company actually in the neighborhood of Genapsis called Genomic Health, where the past 15 years they had, I don't know how many, but a lot of you know, uh, clinical trials and papers and whatnot. We've shown, for example, they started with the top three cancers. For example, for breast cancer, they've shown that in 80% of women with breast cancer, after surgery, they do not need radio, doesn't make any difference for them. Um, with all of these studies to do radiotherapy or chemotherapy. But it still has been you know, advised by doctors and, been, and this is really bad, not only for the healthcare system, but also for the patient themselves. And this is really impacting the body. If you're taking radiotherapy once in your life for cancer A, then you cannot take it later on for cancer, another type. So it has a lot of downsides as well. So all of these are in healthcare. But let's talk about some completely non-healthcare application. One of those would be agricultural biology. Today, we have more than 900 million people suffering from hunger around the globe. From UN and every place that are providing the data, the world population grows. By 2050, we're going to have about, about 10 billion. The hunger population from 900 million or about a billion is going to get doubled. We used most of farmable lands. So it's not like you know, we can go and really find new lands to just farm. The only way to feed the world is really to increase efficiency of every acre of the land. And I'm not talking about GMO. I'm talking about personalized farming. I'm talking about like how we can increase efficiency that we don't lose weight and you know, fruit and whatever we're hoping to harvest at the end of summer that is really happening. A couple of years ago in Florida and a couple of states next to it, there was this virus get to the citrus farms and you know, $13 billion loss. That was a serious, like, because of, if they could catch it early when this disease outbreak is happening, I mean, similar to human <laughs> disease outbreak that can happen to other stuff as well. If you could capture it early, you could really save a lot of those fruits and money and you know, uh, foods. So this is one of many applications that you want to really be able to do smart farming, personalized farming. Find out, okay, well, where you, wanna, where you need to do what, what the type of diseases it may get and whatnot. Other applications, food testing. You want to find out if the food is good or not, if it just went bad. Today, if the food is going bad in whatever, Costco and Safi, and how do they do that? They can't. They just like to make a decision. And it can cause people, you know, uh, it, it was reported 2015, 48 million people in US only got sick because of food related poisoning, different type of food um, uh, issues. That's a very serious number. And we don't have a solution because if you wanted to take the sample and send it to a lab and get the results four months later, that just doesn't work. The food, like, you know, doesn't, the food that can, does, is not going to even remain until then. We got one, one of these very large companies in the food industry reached out to us. They were saying that they have these trucks of food coming from Canada border. And then they wanted to find out the source and safety of the food. And they just can't today. And they were doing research and talking to some people. Actually, they reached out to folks at Harvard. I don't know why, not Stanford, but that person knew about us. So he's a SAB member. He connected basically them to us. So that's one of the other areas. Forensics, security, environmental. When I was back at Stanford, we were doing a project with Brazil, looking at corns to find out which one is a better biofuel and so on and so forth. Right now we have like, you know, people who reached out. Um, there's, a, there's an oil company trying to look at the algaes who are creating corrosion in the oil pipeline. And they wanted to really like, you know, identify the type and be able to deal with that. 
there, there's a professor in Mexico making tequila, you know, where he, he's starting a company and he wanted to really find out which one's going to make a better tequila. There's so many applications. The number of applications are literally endless. And in a multiple areas, in, again, um, not only healthcare, but a lot of applied market. And of course, in top of all of this is research, is discovery. To understand, to better understand the biology, to better understand what's going on in the world. So, with all of that, where we are standing today, we are still in a very early days. The total world population who's done any sort of genetic testing or genome sequence is basically less than 0.005%. How many of us in this room have done genetic testing? Not 23andMe, which is a different story but like, you know, serious genetic testing to find out if you're getting any cancer or not. How many of us, our families are doing that? And we are part of the, we are part of the privileged section of the society. So it's really early days. It's a lot of potential existing there. And a number of life science and molecular research labs, which they need these, there's about 400,000 of them. Only 3,000 can afford to have these massive big machines. So we think the problem is a mainframe to mobile transition, similar to what happened in the computer industry. You know, in the left side, of course, in the top, you see the mainframe computers. You know, it was prior to our days. And of course, went to the PCs and to laptops and iPads and iPhones. And now your iPhone is much more powerful than old PCs. In the bottom left side, you see this. This is the most selling instrument out there. Costs about a million bucks, you know, with about hundred some thousand dollar a maintenance fee, 700 pounds, 40 by 50 by 30 inches. As I mentioned, there are machines which cost $10 million, but this is a million dollar version of it. And that's, um, again, 700 pounds requires a big server next to it and run in a very special condition. In the right side, this is our device, which is a footprint of an iPad. It's portable, last class, a couple of years ago when I gave a talk here, I brought it with myself. Today I didn't because it was coming from somewhere else. But it's a, it's a little machine that you can carry it. It's pure semiconductor based. There is no optics involved. There is no robots. There's all integrated. And the core of that technology is a semiconductor chip that they have some of those chips here. So um, you can have different number of sensors on that chip. But like I use, for example, this one. Um, and here you have millions of sensors right in the middle area here. And on top of that, this is like a three-layer structure. So it's a sensor right in the middle. And then you have this plastic in the top, which has a microfluidic channel. That's basically where the sample goes and is sitting on top of all the sensors. And underneath, you have the LGA, which basically reads the information from the chip. And that little machine supports this chip. And that machine is a self-standing machine. It doesn't need a computer. It already has a computer inside of it. It has a turbo hard drive in it. It has this wire, you know, a wire, a wireless connector to the cloud. It is, it's a pretty powerful machine from that standpoint. And it supports these. And this is the one who does all of the reading part and the data coming off these one and goes to the cloud. And now if you have that, then you can do a lot of um, interesting work in all of those applications that we were talking about. Well, DNA sequencing market by itself, it seems to be a pretty amazing market. Um, from the JP Morgan and UBS, uh, it is a more than $20 billion market 2015, going to be less than 50 by 2018. That's assuming those big machines. A lot of people believe that if you can really shrink the size and make it easier to use and distribute it, it's going to be the next $100 billion technology business. Um, in fact, actually, that article is about the work that I described earlier about the pH detection. That's the semiconductor machine um, wrote on that front. One of many applications is cancer. One of the many applications in cancer is early detection. Um, this is a paper from PNAS, Proceeding of National Academy of Science. Um, which probably after nature and science in the world of science is a really good place to publish. Um, 2008, that shows basically the progress of cancer over 
uh, time, starting from one cancer cell and start growing and making like you know, more and more a number of that, going to the early carcinoma and advanced carcinoma, and then go to metastasis. And usually when it goes to metastasis, it's quite challenging to really fix. Um, even, so it's very important that you be able to capture it early. Depends on the disease, but in general about the cancers, it takes about 30 years. I mean, there are cancers who are effective and literally kill someone in two weeks. But again, in overall, if you want to look at the average, it's a very long time. So it's super important if you can cap cap capture it early. Um, I like the quote by uh, Dr. Snyder, who is the head of the Stanford Genetic Department and director of uh, Stanford Center for Genomics and Personal Medicine. You know, disclosure, he's an SAB member of the company as well. He's talking about, if you look at the industrialized world, there's about a billion people. Of course, in China, we have more than a billion people. In India, we have more than a billion people. If you want to just do once a year annual checkup of a genetic testing at $100 a test, which is much more acceptable for insurances and people and everybody else to pay for that, versus today doesn't exist and is a multi-thousand dollar. For a billion people, that's a billion, that's a hundred billion dollar recurring business every year. And that's really representing where we are with just starting this amazing field. So I stop here. Um, if there's any question, happy to answer. But in general, I very much encourage uh, our friends in the EE department to really use EE background in a in lot of amazing fields that they need our expertise. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. Uh, they usually say that nine out of ten companies fail in their early stages of development, like in the startup period. I mean, my question is, what did you exactly do to make sure that you're the one who succeeds among all of those companies who did want to do the same thing as you wanted to do? Um, uh, thank you. That's a good question. I think I don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> um, what we did to make sure that's not the case. What I can guess is um, we were trying to be extremely clear with ourselves that you know we're not drinking our own Kool-Aid. We are very, we are really uh, trying to um, get everything ready before we wanted to, like you need to basically crawl before you walk and walk before you run. A lot of these companies, I think, they're just getting super excited super early about, you know, there's a, oh, there's a $5 billion market about something, and does, uh, I'm going to be $5 billion worth, which are not necessarily, this is not, there's not a causal relationship there, right? So um, I think the question is, do you have something which truly um, make a difference? You're the right person to do that, and can you take really the right steps to do that? Um, we have, I mean, as an example, back in 2006, uh, when I was doing the management science um, degree, um, we wrote a business, uh, business uh, plan, um, specifically on DNA sequencing with a group of four other people. And at the end of that, the people who were giving grades to us, there were VCs. You know, uh, there's a very good course I recommend uh, you guys if you have the time to get it. Um, I don't know if it's still as good as old days, but uh, you know, MSNE 273. It called um, uh, venture, not venture formation, but something like that. MSNE 273, anyway. Uh, back then, uh, Steve, uh, Steve uh, Blank and a uh, few others were teaching the course. Audrey McLean, etc. It was an amazing course. So. At the end, the professors were not giving you the grade. They were getting VCs from, uh, from Sand Hill Road coming and listening to you, and they were giving grades to you. So some of those folks were interested enough about what we were doing. We were, based on the business plan, we said, like, we want $5 million, and we want to build one working sensor in the scale, like you know, in a small scale. And one of them said, oh, you know, I'm interested to invest here. So. Um, and definitely I got very excited, and uh, I thought that, okay, well, that's the time to go and start a company. Um, went and told OTL, 
um, of the technology licensing and I said, okay, well, I want to license these and so on and so forth. Then I went to my advisor, uh, my PhD advisor, and I told him, you know, there's great opportunity, we can start these. And, and he told me that uh, we just got an NIH grant, a five years NIH grant, a multi, you know, a million dollars NIH grant. And he told me, like, why? Why you want to go under the pressure of VCs while we already have the money to really develop it in-house, in and this is early, so let's just de-risk it here in school. And of course, yes, there were risks. For example, there was a company who got a license from us and got sold for $740 million, but let put that aside, that was a great advice, in my opinion. So from 2006, 2007, until we really started the company, that was three, four years later. But we got much more data points that we knew this is working now to a much higher confidence level. Again, this is a very interdisciplinary, complex you know, um, field. But that, that helped a lot. And then, um, and we were trying to take the very same approach as we were going forward. You know, in my series A, for example, like, you know, there was a lot of investors who were trying to give you more money than what we wanted. We thought that we want to raise 20 million, but there were some investors who were trying to give us 50. And we're trying to really push back and said, hey, why 50? Like, so, oh, you probably need it. So, okay, well, yes, we may need it, but we're going to come back. Why we need to get it today from you? And then when I saw that dynamic, then I even asked the people that, you know what? I said 20, but actually I don't want 20. I want only 10 because of, there are apparently interested parties, so why should I raise all 20 now? And then um, I chose the, the party who was willing to work with me on a lower amount, and the second one would be in my hand to decide if I want to raise that money or not. So really being able to have a lot of, um, you know, again, baby steps and control the steps, I think that that helps. Okay.